13, verse 55 with me uh, tonight, please. I want to talk about the secret of the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Put it this way, probably best to say it this way, one of the secrets of His power. Matthew chapter 13 and verse number uh, 55. Matthew 13, verse 55. The Scripture says, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James, Joseph, and Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Father, bless this book now. And give me unction tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. As you and I both know, pride is the enemy. It is a horrible enemy. And it can masquerade itself in so many different ways, even to the point to come across as humble. And the Lord Jesus Christ had no problem with pride. But what we'll find here tonight as I go from point to point is that it is an amazing thing at how that He manifests in His life, just His life, such a, such a uh, detestation for pride. Because notice His birth and His rank. There's nothing here that's uh, great about it. No king. Is not this the carpenter's son? That's quite a remarkable thing, don't you think? We know who his father was, don't we? In the book of Matthew chapter number 8 and verse number 20, we read these words. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He wasn't a rich man either. As far as the earthly possessions were concerned, silver and gold, <clears throat> he could say exactly what Peter said to the man at the gate called beautiful. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. The Lord Jesus Christ had no pride of wealth. He had no pride of birth, and he had no pride of wealth. He wasn't a rich man. I know that the name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, prosperity preachers are telling people he was rich. Folks, he was rich, but not with money. He had to call a fish up to get the money to pay his taxes. Money was not the issue with him. He didn't come here to be rich. He came here to make you rich. And the riches that he gives you is not money. Money, he gives you stuff money cannot buy. Amen. Notice what it says in John chapter number 1 and verse number 46. John 1, 46. After a while you begin to build a case of uh, these things that uh, begin to uh, build on each other and complement each other. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip saith unto him, Come and see. So where he was born, wasn't born in Nazareth, where he was raised up, his hometown, that's where he came to after they came back up out of Egypt. They went up to Nazareth. His hometown was uh, on the wrong side of the tracks. And so uh, he did not uh, cause himself to be, become part of the social scene. And why? Because this is part of who he is. Constantly over and over and over again, he's showing you how that of himself he made himself nothing. That everything that he was to mankind was a product of the work of the Holy Spirit of God. It is who God made Christ to be to them. And that's who he is to us today. It is who the Lord Jesus Christ becomes to us today by the work of the Holy Spirit of God. He doesn't present himself as anything. He presents himself as a servant. If you'll notice what he says in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 53 and verse number 2. In Isaiah 53 and verse 2 it said, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. No one is drawn to Christ because of outward physical appearance. He didn't appear in stature as some great thing, some noble thing. Just a humble man walking in their midst. Nothing beautiful about him. Of course, if you're looking for beauty on the outside, you're looking at the wrong place. The beauty is in the holiness, the Bible says. The beauty is in the heart and in the soul. You see, the outside withers and fades and dies, but that which is inside will never wither nor fade, nor die. At 93 years of age, you can be more beautiful than you are when you're 20. 
when you were born again by the grace of God. Amen. I want you to notice what it says in the book of, uh, of Matthew chapter number 11 and verse 19. Matthew eleven nineteen. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But he said, Now note carefully, wisdom is justified of her children. In other words, <clears throat> judge me like I judge the fig tree. In plainer words, judge me by the disciples that I produce. Wisdom is justified by her children. In plainer words, if the wisdom of God is manifested in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, then His disciples will manifest divine wisdom, divine, the divine hand of God on their life because they're true believers in Christ. Therefore, it's not so much the words that are said, but the life that produces a life. And this is what he's talking about here. And notice carefully uh, his reputation. He's a friend of sinners. And the Pharisee would not so much as allow a sinner into his house that if this man were a prophet, he'd know this woman wiping uh, his feet with her hair and crying was a sinner. And sinners don't come into my house. Oh, is that so? Well, then you need to get up and leave, Mr. Pharisee. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. He says in 1 John 1, I told the, Sunday, I told the class Wednesday night in prayer meeting, in 1 John chapter number 1 it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And then it says in 1 John 1, it says, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Talking about God. And that's not somebody you're trying to get right with God. That's everybody. And it's sandwiched in between that is this wonderful statement. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And to cleanse it from all unrighteousness. I love the word confess there. It's translated from the Greek word hamalagia. And the Greek word hama means of the same order or type. Lagia is word. So what it centrally means is that you come into agreement with God. God doesn't come into agreement with you. You come into agreement with God about who you are and your personal condition. And when that point is reached in your fellowship with the Lord, your fellowship takes on an entirely new meaning. I confessed yesterday something to God. Said something, it wasn't five seconds later, and I said, I'm sorry, Lord. <laughs> Just that fast. Shouldn't have said that. It shouldn't have, shouldn't have said it. You say, well, I've gotten to the point where I don't say anything. Good for you. I haven't gotten there yet. <clears throat> Pray for me. <laughs> sometimes my mouth gets engaged before my brain does. <laughs> it has, uh, you know, I thought sometimes it would be nice to send a Christmas gift to some people. You know these teeth that just chatter like that? And there's no head, there's no eye, there's no brain, nothing, just, just chattering teeth. Well, that's been me on occasion. And I said, God, forgive me. And you know what he did? He forgave me. And I could have harbored that and carried that on in my life. Let that thing build, let it fester, and it would give birth to something else. And it always gets bigger. It's like a fire. A fi you, can, you can burn Knoxville, Tennessee down with a match. One match. What was it? Uh, someone, somebody's cat that knocked over a, a lantern up there in a, in a barn in Chicago, Illinois. I think something like that. I forget exactly the details. The, the pardon? A cow knocked over a lantern in a barn in, Wash in, in Chicago, Illinois, and burned half the town down. I remember one time I was in Chicago. Uh, they, they, I think it was my mother. I was visiting with her in Chicago, and she said, See that building down there? And I forget what it was. Uh, I don't remember the name of the street, but she says, That is the only thing left from the original Chicago, and the Chicago fire in downtown Chicago is that building. And they've got it showcased because it's a historical thing. It's all that was left. It's like when you go to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and you go to that uh, where, the, where the Liberty Bell is located. You've got this huge modern city around it, but here's this, uh, here's this uh, 16th century, uh, here's this 16th century uh, building. That, uh, with the, Philadelphia was the original uh, the, uh, capital of the United States and uh, before it was moved to Washington, D.C. So they, they showcase things like this, and they stand out uh, because of that. Well, I'm glad, thank God tonight, that God forgives. Amen. I'm glad He forgives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to make errors, and we're going to say things we shouldn't say, and do things we shouldn't do. But if we'll confess it, if we'll come into agreement with Him, then He'll forgive us. 
and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, I'd like to just mention this while I'm on that in 1 John 1, 9. He said, he said, if we confess our sins, God is faithful. If you'll just take that God is faithful and do a New Testament study on that, you'll be amazed at what you find. Where God is faithful, the faithfulness of God. Amen. The wonderful thing. Now I want you to look at the book of, uh, uh, book of Luke chapter number 8 and verse number 3. Luke chapter number 8 and verse number 3. And Joanna, the wife of, of uh, Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. Now, I want you to notice who this woman is. Who is she? She's the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. This is the Herod of unbelief. This is an unbeliever. And she's connected directly with him because her husband is a steward in his house. Yet she's a believer. She's a true believer. And notice what it says of her in verse number uh, 3. And she ministered unto him of their substance, their goods. Maybe gave him a place to sleep. Gave him something to eat. Set a table before him. My, if he had been a proud man, that had been hard to accept, wouldn't it? But he allowed himself to be subject to things like that because there was no pride to be found in him. Pride is your enemy, folks, in every form that it takes. In the book of John, chapter number 7 and verse number 15, John 7, 15, we read these words. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters? having never learned. My, 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 no degrees after his name. <laughs> Don't want to make you mad. <laughs> I saw a sign one time in front of a local New Testament church that said, preachers are dying by degrees. <laughs> now that's a play on words. <laughs> that's a play on words. Think about what it says. And they have been dying by degrees. There's nothing wrong with an education. I think it helps. Ignorance is no, nothing to glorify and glory in for certain. The Bible says we're destroyed for lack of knowledge. Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But on occasion I'll look in a, I'll look in a newspaper, a flyer or something that comes and they're promoting a revival meeting or some kind of a meeting and I, it's just the meanness in me. I know what I mean. I agree. I look at it and every one of them is a doctor that's speaking at the meeting. No reverence are allowed, just doctors. So I think to myself, well, they must plan on having a big meeting then. Now what I'm talking about makes people mad, folks. What I'm saying to you tonight, some of these preachers get hopping mad because they are very proud of their education. You ought to be proud of your Savior. Without him, a PhD, a THD, a THM, and all the rest of it is just a bunch of garbage. If you've never been to Calvary and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's just a bunch of junk. That's all it is. All that really matters is that you know the Savior. In Luke chapter number 22 and verse number 27, we read these words. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth? Now the Lord's talking here. Is not he that sitteth at meat? He's greater, he says. This is a, this is a rhetorical question. It's a question that says there's an answer to this, but when you give the answer, think about the answer. See? In other words, it's a question that makes a statement. Now note carefully. <clears throat> For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth. Is not he that serveth, or he that sitteth at meat? What's the answer? Which one's greater? He that sitteth at meat. True. Now watch this. Here's what the Lord says of himself. I am among you as he that serveth. See that? I take the place of the servant. You go ahead and sit at meat. I'll serve. Now think about that. Think about it. 
if I, your Lord and Master, have done this, ought you not to? You call me Lord and Master and do well, for so I am. But let me show you something. You know what's killing us? It is our pride. It's our ego. Ego is a Greek word that is transliterated straight into English. The Greek letters are taken from Greek and put into English. In Greek it is ego, I me, which is an emphatic statement of look at who I am. I am me. That's ego, I me. So you take the ego, epsilon, gamma, omicron, you take it and transfer it literally from Greek into English and you've got ego, E-G-O. That's all you've done. You haven't translated it. And the ego is what the philosophers talk about, the psychologists talk about, the ego. You get a bunch of men together who have big egos, and boy, you've got a problem going on. Because they had best recognized each other's abilities and achievements and accomplishments. And oh, it's so wonderful to be in the presence of such and such and such and such and one. And I've heard that stuff and sometimes I just want to gag. <laughs> I think to myself, the best presence you've ever been in, it's the most wonderful presence you'll ever be in, get in the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Amen. He may be dead tomorrow. <laughs> you may be preaching his funeral. He may pull out of here with all of his accolades and go down here to Broadway and get T-boned <laughs> and be lying a dead corpse somewhere in the morgue. So what is he? There are men today there are men today that literally worship at the altar of some of these Baptist preachers that are gone now. And if you said one word about their God, they would come after you like you would not believe. But I would say one thing to them. Have you noticed how God got along before he ever showed up? And have you noticed how God's got along since he's been gone? Have you noticed that his coming and his going didn't do anything for the Lord? <laughs> But if he had anything ever done, God did it for him, not him for the Lord. Do you realize that my little short time on this earth, I have never added one thing to God's stature? I haven't improved his holiness one bit. I haven't done one thing to make him better, but he has done so much for me. So much, so much, so much. This is why the Apostle Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pride of learning. And he said, I am one that serveth. He humbled himself. In John chapter number 1 and verse number 11, we read these words. Have you noticed how this is building tonight? John 1, 11. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. Who's his own, folks? The Jews. And those of you in Sunday school know that a Jew and Israel are synonymous. That Israel and the Jews are synonymous. You know that. And that British Israelism is a bunch of garbage. It's trying to rob the Jewish people of their heritage and trying to claim that they have a mandate from God to spread empires across the face of this earth. And that's what you're dealing with when you're dealing with British Israelism which I have no use for. And British Israelism is just another branch of the Hebrew Roots Movement. And all, anything else, it's, I, just, I was just on a website right before I came over here tonight. I was on a website, and the fellow that runs the website has got a good, has got a good website when it deals, to, deals with stuff like CERN and stuff like that, you know, that I was, I've been talking to you about. But then he's got this stuff posted on his website. And one of the, one of the posts says this, says that now since the apostles... Uh, recognize the Passover and the Jewish feast days and all of this other, how come we don't? All right. See? He, he's, he's planting something in your mind. He's planting a seed in your mind. If the apostles uh, recognize the Passover and the feast days, Pentecost and all that, why don't we do that? Well, I'll give him an answer. Christ is the end of the law. All of these things were nothing in the world more than shadows pointing toward the full, the real Passover. The Apostle Paul said, Christ is our Passover. 
And the day of Pentecost was the day when the 50th day after Passover when the Holy Spirit came down in power. Why should we celebrate Pentecost? That's a one-time event, never to be repeated again. It only happened one time in history. It'll never happen again. But when He came in Acts chapter number 2 in the day of Pentecost, He baptized every one of them with the Holy Ghost. And He had to do that to form the body of Christ. And He put them in Christ. On that very day, the church of the living God was born. And we've got Pentecostal brethren, a lot of good people. And I respect a lot of them, no question about this. They mean well. But they think they can have a new Pentecost year in and year out and year in and year out. No, you can't. There's just one Pentecost. You can have a new filling. You can have a new power of the Holy Spirit. You can have that. But there's only one baptism of the Holy Ghost. At the moment that you are born again by the Spirit of the living God, He baptizes you by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. For there is one Spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, I think it is, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. And that takes place at the very moment of conversion. And if you don't have the Spirit of God, folks, you don't belong to Him. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. All this stuff is a transitional thing that brings us to this present moment where we are tonight. The most ludicrous thing in the world is for somebody to think he's a Christian and then turn around and tell you he doesn't have the Holy Ghost. And there are people in the Pentecostal church who believe that. They believe that they're true Christians, but they don't have the Holy Ghost yet. And they're praying for that. And you won't find one passage in the New Testament that will bear that out. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. You can't be born again. He that is born of the Spirit is spirit. And he that is born of the flesh is flesh. And that's John who wrote that. So that's where we stand today. And so he came into his own, and his own received him not. So as Moon says, I remember one time I, Mooney, how many know what a Mooney is? Uh, a Mooney is a follower of Sun, Sun Moon, uh, a Korean. And I don't think he's still alive now, but uh, he taught. That, that, that He essentially was the, was the restoration of the Messiahship on earth. And that He taught that the Lord Jesus Christ failed miserably in His ministry and did not accomplish what He came here to do. So therefore Moon was going to pick up where Christ left off. The real humble fellow. I, uh, Mooney met me one time out here off, the, off Clinton Highway, and we got into it. Oh, Lord. I'm just glad nobody was around. <laughs> Boy, do we ever lock horns. I mean, he came at me with a superior, holier-than-thou, righteous attitude, like I'm the only real Christian on earth because I'm out here handing out material and literature. And let me tell you something. And he started with that attitude. And uh, the idea was that Moon was the true manifestation of the, of, of, the, of the Messiahship on earth, and that Christ had failed. Well, John chapter number 1 says He came into His own, and His own received Him not. Right? That looks like a failure, doesn't it? You see what I mean? He came to His own. He came to the Jews, and the Jews received Him not. The last chapter of the book of Acts, when we're talking about the Jews, you remember in Sunday school we talked about this this morning. The last chapter of the book of Acts, the Bible says that the Jews had no small disputation among themselves. They were arguing. They were arguing about who is this man? Is Christ the true Messiah or is he not the Messiah? And the Apostle Paul says that God handed down a judicial judgment on the Jewish people and blinded them. And to this very day they are blinded. And that's what he talks about in Romans chapter number 11. Did he fail? No, he didn't fail. He offered one sacrifice for sin forever and sat down at the right hand of the Father on high. He came into the world not to restore the Jewish people and not to lead the Jewish people. He came into the world, as John the Baptist says, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The Lord Jesus Christ's primary and first ministry was to offer Himself on the cross at Calvary, not to come to be a Jewish Savior. His first ministry in this world was to come to make men free and give Himself a ransom for our sins. The Jew takes his rightful place. He died for him, but he also died for the Gentile. He didn't come to die as a Jewish Savior. He came to die as the Savior of all mankind. He didn't fail. He didn't fail. And every one of you in this house tonight that have ever been born again, he didn't fail you, did he? That new birth is as real in your soul right now, the day it happened, and it's new because it's real because of what Christ did at the cross at Calvary. And Moon was dead wrong. 
and I, I don't know where Moon went. I'm, I'm not God. I'm not Moon's judge. But I'll tell you this right now. I, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes claiming to be a Messiah. I'm no Messiah. I'm an old junkyard dog that God called, and by his mercy he saved, and he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he's been the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life. I wouldn't swap him for every church, every preacher, every ministry, every thing that's ever happened on this earth. I'll take Jesus. Give me Jesus. Let me have Jesus. He's the satisfier of my soul. Nobody has ever helped me like Jesus has helped me. There's no other name in my heart and in my soul like the name of Jesus. He's the greatest thing I've ever heard of, and I look forward to the day when I lay eyes on that blessed Lamb of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what it's about, folks. Everything else is peripheral. Everything else is, 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 uh, is incidental. It takes its place. It has its identity. It has its meaning. It has its place in life as it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the center of everything. Of Him, to Him, through Him, from Him are all things. The Bible said in Colossians chapter number 1 that everything that was made was made by Him and for Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't fail. He accomplished exactly what he intended to do. What's the last thing he said at the cross? It is finished. To tell us die. It is done. And so it is. And heresy and wickedness and perversion always tries to either add to what he did or detract from what he did. But if you truly believe tonight, you look at Calvary and say, that's enough. Job's done. That's all that's necessary. You go to the cross, meet him there. You don't need anything else added. That's his righteousness and the righteousness of God. So, in Luke chapter number 2, verse 51... I better hurry up. I got 35 more points here tonight. We'll be here. <laughs> Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 51. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. He subjected himself to the authority of his mother and of a stepfather, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's humility. That's humility. He subjected himself unto them. In John chapter number 5 and verse number 30. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. John 5, 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. He could have done on his own, because he was the second person of the Trinity. He never gave up one bit of his deity when he came into this world. And when he came into this world, the angels and demons both knew who he was. And the demons at his voice fled scared to death because of the Son of God. And the angels were told in, in the book of Hebrews chapter number 1, when He bringeth the first begotten into the world, let all the angels of God worship Him. And they gathered in the heavens, and those shepherds in the field at night in Bethlehem, and they began to sing praises unto God. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a King, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And so it was. They worshipped Him. The angels came when He was at the Garden of Gethsemane, right Right before he offered himself on the cross, the Bible said those angels came and ministered unto him. I like what Spurgeon says about that. I read this something like 25 or 30 years ago. Charles Haddon Spurgeon quoting that scripture and making reference to it where these angels ministered unto them. He said, we can only guess what they might have said to him. What did they say to the Son of God when he was there? being ministered to by the angels. Moses and Elijah showed up on the top of Mount of Transfiguration. They talked about his exodus. They talked about his decease. And that was the word used there, exodus, when he departed, left this world. Like Peter said, the Lord hath, done showed, the Lord hath showed me how that I must shortly put off this my tabernacle. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ came down to the end, the angels came and ministered to him. That's a remark. I'd like to have listened in on that. <laughs> I'd like to have heard what they said. To him. Say, so what they say, preacher, we don't know, folks. It's not recorded anywhere. Uh, one guess is as good as another. But they ministered to him. They ministered to him. What a thing. In the book of John, chapter number five, 
I can do nothing of myself. In John chapter number 5 again, he said, I seek not mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Notice the word that's important here, I seek his will, not my will. And that, my friend, is brought out into the open at Gethsemane. For he said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Sometimes our will may be good. Our will may be righteous. Our will may be wonderful. Our will may be the kind of will that people would love to emulate. But it's not the will of God. His will is what we should live for. And that's, that's easy, easy, these are easy words to say tonight, but they're powerful words. For the will of God sometimes is not palatable. It's not what you want, but it's the will of God. So the Lord Jesus Christ said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And so it was that he went to the cross and died. What was that will? Well, I've heard preachers say, well, it was he was scared to death to die, didn't want to die. You think that's what it was? He said, for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despised the shame, physical death. Well, my goodness, folks, for, for 2,000 years, Christians have gone to their martyrdom with joy all over their face. No fear, joy. I remember reading one time, or hearing, I think I still heard it. This man was, was appointed to death. He was going to die a martyr's death. Now, I don't know how, the sword or there were, what, but that's, that's not the point. The executioner was ready to take his life. And this Christian martyr was standing there, and the executioner was standing next to him. And the Christian martyr said, give me your hand. And the executioner gave him his hand. He said, now feel my heart. And his heart was just, ka-dum, 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 ka-dum. About 70 beats a minute. Just as calm. That executioner knew there was more in him than there was in him. Here's a man about to go off into eternity, and he, was a, he wasn't, didn't even break a sweat. To be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. The executioner, of course, usually they get nervous because you're taking a human life. That's not a, you know, that's not a, that's not a, a, a small thing. But the man was ready to go and meet God. That's, uh, that's a good way to go, to go like that. That's a good way to go, to go like that. In John chapter number 8 and verse number 28, he said, uh, John 8, 28, Then said Jesus to them, When you have lifted the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these words. So He from day one, from His earliest waking moments, listened to the voice of God and was taught and listened and received instruction from the Father. That's, per, that's humility. In Luke chapter number 9, verse number 50, Luke 9, 50, we read these words. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. In other words, you don't have to belong to my little hand-picked group right here. You don't have to be part of this movement. Uh, you didn't go to our fellowship. You didn't graduate from our Bible college. That's okay. Do you know the Lord? Well, if you know the Lord, that's all that matters. Do you know the Lord? That's all that matters. Some folks, if you don't hammer it out on their anvil, if you don't sign their declaration of faith, if you haven't been approved by their synod or their group, they consider you a heretic. And you're pushed out the door and you're not part of what's happening. I don't see it that way. I really don't. Here's the way I see it. A Baptist that will go to the polls and vote for a baby killer. <coughs> And one now who has turned against Israel and who has promoted the pervert agenda and walk out of that polling booth proud as he can or she can be. And you compare them with these little Iraqi girls over here who may do this. A lot of them over there do that. 
That's all they've ever known. That's what they were raised in. The only Baptist I ever saw do that was Ed Blue. <laughs> he can get away with it. <laughs> he can get away with it. A lot of people do this, folks. You need to understand that, that aren't Catholics. A lot of people. But these little girls, when confronted by these murdering Muslims, who just marched, by the way, another group of men, uh, uh, African, what are they down there? Uh, Ethiopian. A bunch, uh, a group of Ethiopian Christian men, they just marched them out next to the sea and cut their heads off. These are murderers. And so they confronted these little girls over there in Iraq. And these little girls over there in Iraq said, No, we'll not convert. We love Jesus. We love Jesus. We love Jesus. And so they died a martyr's death. I would not want to be in the shoe of that Baptist that went into that polling booth and voted for baby killers. And in his or her arrogance stand up and sing in the church of God, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. And when you've got these Iraqi girls over here, these little kids that are giving their life for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you weigh the two together. And I'll guarantee you the Baptist will not weigh against that those little kids. And I'm not saying that I agree with all their doctrine. They're more than likely amillennial uh, in, in their doctrine. They're probably sprinkled as babies. They cross themselves. They've got a lot of the traditions of the Orthodox Church and all of that. But if in their heart and in their soul they are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, if you're willing to give your life, what do you think? I don't believe they're playing games. If you're willing to give your life, I mean, all you got to do is say, I'll, 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 I'll accept Mohammed, whatever it is they want you to do. And they could have died. They could have spared themselves, but no, they died. No, 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 don't come to me and talk about it. I don't hear it. I don't hear it. Don't, don't offend me with this American cultural Christianity. Don't offend me with that garbage. We've got brothers and sisters all over this world who are willing to die for our Lord Jesus Christ who may not see everything exactly the way you do. So I'm not sectarian. You don't have to go to my school. You don't have to belong to my clique. You don't have to be part of my fellowship. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ and truly love Him, then you're my brother and you're my sister. And i got no problem with it. Amen, folks. I don't know how to say it any plainer than that. You're my brother and you're my sister. And then finally, we've got a couple more. We'll come to a close in here in Luke chapter number 23 and verse 34. Luke 23, verse number 34. Luke 23, 34, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All the way to the cross, he was still humbled, not fighting for himself. He was giving himself. Father, they don't know what they're doing. I'm giving myself for them. Lord, don't hold it against them. Forgive them. Be merciful to them. My, what a thing. <laughs> what a thing. Has anybody ever treated you like that in this world? You cross somebody today in this world, buddy, and they'll come after you jugular. That's right. And uh, you know what America's fallen into. They call it a litigious society. What's that mean? That means they sue over everything. Anything and everything. They're ready to sue you. Not him. Said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then we read in uh, Luke chapter number 15, verse number 2. Luke 15, 2. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. I remember meeting one time about, about 30 years ago. This is one of the benefits that God's blessed me with a horrible memory, but it's a few things I do remember. I remember about 30 years ago I met with some men, a, a group of men that represented a church. <coughs> they wanted to do something. And they wanted to talk to me about it. So I went in. I was alone. Oh, I don't know, five, six, seven men in there. And we sat down at the table. And then we began to talk about what they wanted to do. And I got the distinct feeling, oh, did I ever, when I walked into that room and sat down at that table, they wouldn't look at me eyeball to eyeball. It was this. Look in there. 
Now, I've, I do better than you. I've got a longer nose than most people. I mean, I've got, you know, that thing you see on TV, the agony of defeat. This guy comes off of that big, long thing, falls. <laughs> That's what I've got here. And so, when I look down my nose at you, I'm looking a long way, all right? <laughs> Boy, did they ever. I got the distinct feeling that I was in the presence of deity and that they were condescending to my level so that we could communicate. I really did. That's awful to feel that way. That's horrible. And uh, it didn't work out the way they intended for it to work out, but I was left with that feeling. That's why I remember it so much. If I could remember every meeting and everything for 38 years of pastoring a church, I probably believe would go screaming mad. But certain things down through the years that have happened to me have made an indelible impression that just burned into my soul. And I walked out of that room thinking to myself, my goodness gracious, these people think they're something. <laughs> they really do. They wanted me to understand that they were so important that they took time to meet with me and, and condescend to my level and communicate with me on my level. And I thought to myself, that's not the Spirit of Christ. You know what James says, don't you? He says, you may walk through that back door with a $500 suit on. And here comes one over here with, uh, uh, we used to call them tennis shoes when I was young. You know, what do you call them today? <laughs> tennis shoes? <laughs> <laughs> Some things don't change, do they? <laughs> uh, overalls, you know, uh, just, just common dress. All right. Well, back in James said that the man who comes in with a $500 suit on, you give him the high seat. You lift him up. Now, what's the point in that, you know, by the way? What are you, what are you doing this for? You, something you want from him? Or you, is, he, is he the standard that everybody else is judged by? Whatever it is. Uh, James said ought not to be so. In plainer words, everybody should be treated the same. They should feel, when you walk through this house, walk into this house right here, you'll notice the floor is level. Nobody asks you where you work and how much money you make. You don't hear this preacher up here in this pulpit talking about so-and-so, how much money so-and-so has given, and what a great uh, pillar of the church that so-and-so has been. And I go to churches, I've heard that garbage. Oh, so-and-so, this is this family, this, this church is in existence today because of this family, or he's a pillar of the church, or, or this or that, or so-and-so has given so much to this ministry and to this work. And what you're doing when you're doing that is exalting people. You're lifting up people. We don't that. I want somebody to come into this house that doesn't even have a job. They should feel welcome. You're, you're making six figures? Good for you. But what's the difference between you making six figures and the one who, who works at McDonald's or somewhere like that? Honest work's honest work. I firmly believe in that. By the way, this past week I've seen at least three or four different help wanted signs. I've been in places where the least thing I expected to see was a help wanted sign. <laughs> There's jobs out there. We got folks who come around the church every once in a while and they say, would you give me an offering? Would you help me with a handout? You know, they're not part of the church. They just come in they want money. And I'd like to say to them, sure, here's the hand. Here, stick your hand out. Now, here's a, here's a tool. <laughs> Here, here's a shovel. Here's a broom. We'll give you a hand up, not a hand out. You know what you do with people, folks, if you're constantly just giving, 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 and you want to give. I feel good about giving. I mean, how, did you feel, how many of you all feel good about the money that's going to Haiti? These Haitians can't help themselves. They can't do anything about their situation. But we have people, I'm talking about people that come, they go, to, they go around to the churches. They make their rounds. They go from one church to the next. I mean, they're professionals at it. And they wouldn't work. They won't work. But, the, you know, the idea is that we'll help you. But if we just keep giving you and giving you and giving you and giving you, we are not helping you. We are enabling you. We are making it possible for you to stay in a state that you're in where you'll never get any better. So instead of just enabling you, let's help you. Let's give you a hand up. You want help? We'll help you learn a trade. We'll see if we can't get you a job somewhere where you can learn something. You have no skills. You've got no education. Well, then you've got two strikes against you. But you can still come out of it. Get a skill or get an education. Learn how to do something or go to school. 
one or the other. What's the alternative? A freeloader. And what are you going to be? If you're a freeloader today, 50 years from now, you'll still be a freeloader. You'll never improve yourself. So I firmly believe in a hand up. The Apostle Paul was real clear about it. What was it he said? How did he say it? If you don't work, you don't what? And everybody likes to eat. You ever met anybody who didn't like to eat? We all like to eat. A hand up. Before I got out of the Marine Corps, I came home on leave and I got a job with Van Slack Volkswagen on Clinton Highway as a mechanic. I had a job waiting for me when I got out. I think I got out on a Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday or something like that. I went to work the following Monday and I was so thankful that I had a job because I have never, if you want to destroy me, put me somewhere where I can't do anything, I'm ready to go. I have never wanted to sit on my duff and not do something. I got a job and I was glad I had a job. Thank God for that. Even as a lost man, I was glad I had a job. And so I want to encourage you tonight, you can do better. God will bless you, but you're going to have to join in and make an effort to improve your life. So if you come around, you have need, we'll give you a hand up, not a hand out. And the worst thing you can do is to take somebody who's a drug addict and just keep pumping money into them and buy drugs and buy drugs and buy drugs. All you're doing is enabling. And listen, what you're sharing in their destruction. Because if you're helping them buy drugs, folks, you are helping kill them because drugs will kill you. That's not love. Love is to get them out of it and have, give them a hand up and help them. Amen. How many of you are excited now about going to work in the morning? <laughs> I'll, sh I'll say this and I'll shut up. I knew a guy in high school. He bragged about sleeping till 12 o'clock every day. I thought, I thought, good night, 12 o'clock. Folks, can you imagine laying in bed that long? He bragged about it. He thought it was wonderful. He could go to bed and sleep till 12 o'clock the next day. Man, to me, that's a curse. That's a horrible curse. If God's blessed you to where you can get up and go to work, get up and go to work. It's a blessing, folks, not a curse. It's a blessing to be able to work. That's no curse. The curse is not be able to. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said for the glory of God. In thy holy name we pray. Bless my brothers and my sisters tonight. In thy sweet name we ask it. And amen. All right, let's stand up tonight.